Hello everyone, Eric the Violinist here, and I want to welcome you to episode 4 of the ETV podcast. Today we'll be discussing the impact social media can have on a musician's career and why it's important in order to build a fan base. I want to introduce to you a friend who's absolutely nailing the social media game. I'm super excited to be talking to her to help all the musicians out there um, who don't really understand social media and uh, give them a chance to grow their following. So please let me welcome Maria. Maria, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you doing? I'm just great. So for the people who are listening uh, to the podcast and who don't know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, I'm a violist and I'm based in Boston. I go to Boston Conservatory. Um, a little bit about myself, I was born in Ukraine. I grew up in Washington State. I started out as a violinist and actually switched to viola like three years ago. Three years ago. Okay. So you were originally a violinist, then a violist. So what made you uh, do the switch? Honestly, I always like viola more. <laughs> I mean, because it's like cool. Um, I would like always switch instruments with my violist friends and it was just so much more fun to play. I guess I was always a closeted violist. Mm, okay. So tell me a little bit about your journey um, with the viola. So you, you just said that you switch from violin to viola. So what makes the viola really attractive? Um, what motivates you to pick up your instrument every day? Um, well, I think the viola as an instrument is more attractive to me because of like the rich sound, which you probably hear a lot from people. Um, that's what they like about viola. But part of the reason I switched also was because I was really tired of learning violin repertoire, which is a lot of very fast, very difficult um, passage work. And that just wasn't my thing. It wasn't fun for me. Whereas with viola, I feel like I can actually focus on musicality a little more. Um, Sarah, what was the other, what was the second part of the question? Well, no, uh, what motivates you? So you, we just, you just answered the, the violin to viola part. But what motivates you to continue practicing um, and keep playing every day? Um... Honestly, I don't feel motivated to practice and play every day. Um, it's true. I mean, sometimes you have days where you just really want to play and other times where you just don't. Right, yeah. Part of, yeah, part of keeping that motivation is accepting that you're not always going to be motivated and not being too hard on yourself about it. Um, because we're taught from an early age as musicians to always practice every single day and it becomes kind of like a codependent almost like an addiction and you just don't take yourself you have to take yourself a little less seriously sometimes um so it's okay to take breaks for instance at the end of the semester i didn't like touch my instrument for like two weeks and it's kind of horrible sounding but um then when i came back to it i was much more refreshed so um you always need a vacation. Yeah, and I know and I know that you talk about practice efficiency, so that kind of help relates into that realm right there, right? So, you know, it's good to take breaks as a musician because, for one, you could injure yourself, right? You can injure yourself and you could be just exhausted. So can you tell us a little bit about um, trying to find, like, a good balance between your instrument and, um, and your everyday life? Um, I'm still trying to find that balance. <laughs> well, I guess there is no, like there's no set answer to that, right? I think everybody is different. I guess. Um, I guess for me, it's all about awareness. I have to be aware of what I'm doing, how I'm playing. I have to be 100% focused. And if I can't give 100% of that to my music, then sometimes that's even like worse than, non, than not playing. So um, I guess the main thing is for me to set goals every day in my practice. That way I know that Regardless of how long I play, I have set goals that I can say I achieved or didn't achieve and hold myself accountable instead of kind of playing mindlessly for hours. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think there are times where, you know, you have five hours or six hours in the day and you just you think, oh, I got all this practice time. And then, you know, you, you look back on the day and like, I just mindlessly practiced for five hours and I don't know what I achieved. <laughs> I know that I feel that. I don't know if you feel that way too. But um, I want to I wanna go um, move forward with this um, little chat of ours. And you and I met at a festival a few years ago. And that's kind of how we met. We met at this festival in Vermont. And then we kind of became buddy-buddy. And then you and I... Uh, went to the Boston Conservatory together, studied under the same professor. Um, can you tell us the path that you created for yourself and um, 
how you how you came to Boston, what motivated you to go to Boston and uh, do your schoolwork there? Um, okay. Honestly, the summer when we met was probably like one of the hardest times in my life because I still played violin. I kind of wanted to switch viola and I was just really burned out. I was in a music program that I was very miserable in. I had a very, very like not efficient teacher who was um, borderline emotionally abusive to me and his other students. And I was kind of at the end of my rope. I was actually thinking about quitting music. And um, I came to this festival, and I brought my viola with me along with my violin to just kind of, I don't know, maybe take a few viola lessons. And I really did not know where my life was going at this point. It was just a very hard time for me. And then when I met your teacher and um, saw him teach a master class, he really inspired me with the things he said and his attitude. And after taking a lesson with him, I realized that maybe I should just switch to viola. I could, I saw myself like wanting to study with this person. And Boston Conservatory was like on my bucket list already because I had first gotten in as a violinist three years prior and I decided not to go and it was my biggest regret. So um, after meeting our, now our teacher, um, I just became, it was kind of like the push I needed. And I just decided to uproot everything and move to Boston. That's wonderful. So yeah, I know that um, <clears throat> you you and I have the same circle of friends, and you and yeah, we definitely spend some time together at uh, the Boston Conservatory. And yeah, and you know, for people who are um, interested in the audition process for conservatories, what is? And I actually asked this in a mutual friend of ours, Ruben. Um, I don't know if you remember Ruben from Green Mountain. I asked this question um, to him last time. So what what are the things that you focus on in your practicing and how can you and how do you make your practice as efficient as possible? Um, honestly, you just have to set goals. You have to be realistic with your goals. Instead of being like, "Oh, I want to make learn this concerto." You take it one small step at a time. Like say, "I want to work on my vibrato today or I want to work up the intonation in this passage." You really have to narrow it down instead of just wanting to make everything better. You have to break it down. And in order to break it down, you have to be very aware of what you're struggling with. So um, it can be really hard to get started in finding that and setting realistic goals. So I recommend recording yourself and seeing exactly what your pitfalls and your shortcomings are so you know exactly what to work on step by step. And really don't try to take everything on right away. Um, I had this one teacher who would just always tell me, like, oh, fix intonation, like, do this, do this, and he would throw all of these things at me at once, and your brain can't do that. So, I don't know, focus on just only intonation for, like, 20 minutes, and then only vibrato for another 10. So, you really have to break it down and practice very slowly. It seems like you got this practice thing nailed. I should learn a little bit from you. (laughs) I actually want to dive into one of your greatest accomplishments, and that is Instagram. You are one of the Instagram queens when it comes to the classical music world. And you were featured in Strings Magazine, and you currently have 23,000 followers, 23,000 since the last time I checked, which was yesterday. Uh, Did you expect Instagram to have such an impact on your life? Honestly, no, I didn't. I thought it was just going to be a little side project, but um, it's just, it's been really great. It's opened a lot of opportunities for me, and I feel like it's helped me a lot. And the cool thing about it is, like, you never know what what it's going to bring you, like, the connections that you're going to make on there. Um, so what was, yeah, so what was the, the primary purpose of you posting videos on Instagram? Um, honestly, I was always really self-conscious about posting videos of myself because I'm so self-critical and, um, and I'm a very, I'm also a very shy person, so I don't always, I'm not always the most outspoken if there's, like, if I don't know everyone. So Instagram kind of became my outlet where I would share, like, the music that I like to play, which wasn't always the music that everyone knew, or it was just also a way for me to overcome my anxiety of posting videos of myself playing. So for anybody who's struggling with social media, what have you found that was successful in in your posting and in your, I know that hashtagging is such a big thing and I know I use my hashtags as well. 
But what what kind of advice that you can give people who are trying to figure out this social media and feels like it's very overwhelming because there's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you have you have a whole other bunch of platforms. And what what can you yeah what kind of advice can you give people who are just starting out or who are just not sure where to start? Um, honestly, just share what's on your mind um, and go from there. I get a lot of questions um, from people asking how I grew my following as if there's, like, some secret, like, trick to get so many followers. But the thing is, I've been doing this for, like, over two years. And I guess the biggest tip I can offer people is be patient. You just have to keep on posting consistently, post quality content over time. And you'll kind of figure out what works and what doesn't, and you'll kind of find your niche. But you have to be patient and don't expect to get, like, thousands of followers right away. Because I, I see a lot of people who get started and they want to do it and they post a lot. And then after a couple of weeks, they just stop because they, you know, they don't see a huge following right away and they just become disinterested. You just have to keep on going and work hard at it. It's not just – it's kind of like practicing you, know, you have to take little baby steps over a long period of time. Yeah, that was the next thing I was actually going to uh, talk about because, you know, in music, when we're trying to learn a piece, we want, I feel like we were living in a society that, um, you know, we, have, we want instant results right away. We want to be able to play the next Paganini Caprice or we want to be able to play, you know, Hindemith Viola, you know, pieces. And, you know, that it just doesn't work that way. I feel like, you know, the world is going so fast that everything needs to be really fast. But people should play the long game is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Just want to ask one last question. Can you uh, give any advice for the musicians that are tuning in uh, that would help them in their careers? Not And so we talked about social media. We talked about practicing. But, you know, generally speaking, bigger picture, what should people be thinking about? I feel like you just, you never know what's going to come at you, what kind of opportunities you're going to get. And I think the biggest lesson I've learned is when you try to say yes to almost every opportunity that you can, and if you say yes, then commit to it and give your 100%. That way you create a reputation that you're a reliable, organized person. And also answer your emails. Me and you had a conversation about this this week. It's very frustrating. People don't answer their emails you just have to create an image that you're organized and you're hardworking and opportunities will come to you more and more if once you create that image for yourself, I feel like. Yeah, so even like, yeah, I talk about this in my blogs too, trying to be, you know, trying to be very professional and like knowing, like if you're, you know, if you're driving to a gig, know where the address is, know who the contractor is, have their phone number, like really, really basic stuff. If you do the basics really well, then you're really going to succeed, but you have to do the basics very well, consistently for a long period of time. Isn't that right? Exactly. I used to um, have a pretty active uh, ensemble when I lived in Seattle full time. We would play at weddings and at you know events and parties, and I would hire people and put together ensembles. And it wasn't always the best. Like you know, I didn't always choose like the most brilliant player I knew. I chose the people who I knew would show up on time with their music learned, who would be easy to work with. So um, I feel like it's kind of, it's a balance between the two, but a lot of times that ability to be there on time and be a reliable person overrides playing ability when it comes to choosing people for gigs. That being said, Maria, I want to thank you very, very much for your time. I know it's, um, I know it's still the very early morning in Washington at the moment. So thanks for your time. And for, and for people who are um, still interested in learning, learning more about you, if people don't know you, where can they find you? online let's say um well my name is really weird to spell so um you can go to my website it's www.thelittleviolist.com and from there you can find links to my youtube instagram facebook and other stuff wonderful maria thanks again for your time i really appreciate it and uh, we will we hopefully we'll be able to talk in the near future and see uh, and hear about any of your other accomplishments and successes, which by the way, so what do you, what do you have coming up? So you have, um, a masterclass that you're doing this, um, this week and you just announced a tour in Washington. Is that right? You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, in August, I'm going to be giving a recital tour throughout rural Eastern Washington with my friend Grant Hanner. Um, 
We're doing it to raise funds for the American Cancer Society and as well as to bring classical music to communities that don't really have access to classical music. Because in Washington State, we have, like, you know, Spokane and Seattle. Those are the two big classical cities, and then everything in between is kind of isolated. So we're going to be on the road for three or four days together and performing. It's going to be fun. We did it last year, too, so... That sounds like a lot of fun. So, yeah, for people who are listening in, so the littleviolas.com, and I'm sure you could find events um, in in the area in Washington, and you could follow Maria on Instagram, and I'm sure all that Instagram and Facebook information is on her website as well. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, amazing. All right, well, I want to conclude the episode, Maria. Thanks again, and um, we'll we'll talk to we'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Take care, Maria. Thanks again for tuning in to this week's episode of the ETV podcast. If you like what you've heard, please rate me, write a review, and share it. I want to continue giving you all a podcast that you can use as a resource and also share it with others. I want to hear from you also, so write a comment on my website, www.ericmrugala.com slash podcast. Again, that's www.ericmrugala.com slash podcast.